So, welcome to our annual Love Fest. This is the GCC and GDB and GLibc and GNU Toolchain Steering Committee fun discussion Q&A. So, my name is David Edelson. I'm a member of the Steering Committee and wanted to welcome you all. I want to say, first of all, um, that we've been having a great year and just give you a little bit of statistics about uh, how great GCC and all these uh, bin utils can, can speak for themselves. GLibc, for example, uh, Carlos was saying it has you know, 100 commits a month, um, two releases, doing great with the uh, production there. With GCC, we've had about uh, 11,000 commits uh, in the past year. We've dealt with about 4,000 different issues. Uh, we've got some you know, great new technology. I mean, RISC-V is now available. I mean, the great work of now eBPF in the compiler. We have uh, the, you know, the GNU Summer of Code participation with uh, a lot of people. We have actually one of the GNU Summer of Code students here in the audience working on paralyzing uh, GCC, and another student from uh, Wilfrid Laurier uh, that was paid for by the GNU Toolchain Fund for him to be able to attend. Um, got a great number of... Uh, you know, participation from companies, you know, sponsorship from everybody from uh, AdaCore for this, this conference, uh, Mentor, a Siemens company, uh, Red Hat, Arm, Facebook, IBM, Intel, FXios, and Embicosm, and the great work by both uh, Simon and Jeremy Bennett, uh, and Simon Marchi and Sir Jeremy Bennett for helping to arrange and manage this whole thing, uh, the, this conference, doing a great job with that. Um, we even have some new, uh, you know, companies participating. We have Microsoft actually here for the first time uh, participating in the GNU toolchain development. So it's, uh, you know, really great and vibrant community. Glad that you're all participating. Part of about 140, 150 participants registered this year to come. So uh, that's the, the short summary of the great effort that's been going on. And again, let's start with the introducing everybody on the panel. We can start taking questions and see what's, what's on everybody's mind. So. Sure. Um, hi. On? Check? Yes. Um, my name's Carlos O'Donnell. Uh, I work for Red Hat. I'm an upstream uh, GLibc maintainer steward for the project. I'm one of nine. Um, right. I'm Nick Clifton. I'm the BIN Utils uh, maintainer for my sins. And I think our claim to fame this year is we haven't broken anything. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I have to stay on this side of the desk and they okay, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ramana Radhakrishnan. I work for ARM. I maintain the AH32 port uh, and I'm on the GCC steering committee. Jeff Law, I work for Red Hat uh, on the GCC steering committee. I'm Jason Merrill. I also work for Red Hat and I'm on the GCC steering committee. I'm one of the C++ front end maintainers. Joseph Myers, mentor, GCC steering committee, and also GLibc maintainer. <laughs> Tone Muna, um, working on G Fortran every now and then, not that often. Uh, my actual work is being a meteorological researcher at the Dutch Weather Service. Jim Wilson, Sci-5. I work on the Risk Five backend. So, okay. what, what's on everybody's mind? Yeah. Git. Uh. <laughs> Don't we have a separate? And that's a record. That. Okay. Um, you know, we, we all know this has been a, a long process. Um, my personal opinion is we switch to whatever we can use today. Um, I, I'd love to see Eric Raymond get his, his work done, but re realistically, I probably do more archaeology than anybody else in this project, and the mirror does everything I need. I don't need a perfect conversion, and we're not going to remove the SVN repo. It'll always be there read-only, so let's just convert, and I don't care which one we use. Okay, all, by consensus, all in favor? <laughs> all, all against? Okay. Abstentions? <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, then let's 
So by, by consensus and the, the motion to reconsider is tabled, okay, we're done. Yeah. Yep, um, I, haven't, I haven't looked closely at uh, Maxim's conversion, but it seems, it sounds very, very promising and uh, can probably uh, adopt that pretty quickly. I believe uh, the main remaining piece is uh, getting the, the hooks in place to get the same kind of integration with, uh, with Bugzilla that we, that we currently have with, with SVN. That shouldn't take very long, just need someone to do it. History, those, those, those kind of questions. Yeah, um, yeah. I would, I would tend to expect that we would start with uh, basically the, the same uh, workflow that we have now with with SVN, just uh, maintain uh, uh, linear. Uh, in that case, we need a hook which will ensure that so reject all the commits which are against this policy. Sir, um, on on trunk and, and release branches. Yep. Yeah, as long as I can rebase on my development branches. Bur you, you, Mike, please. Yeah. Okay. Use the mic. Use the mic. Oh. Um, yeah, for for the trunk, absolutely, Jakob. As long as as private developers on a private branch can rebase, whatever. I, like Jason, I would say let, let's stick with linear history. Stick with something simple. Get it in. Get using it, and then we can look to to loosen that later if we feel that it, that is valuable. Um, no, I was just going to ask, uh, how complicated are the Git hook integrations? I mean, we recently redid the glibc Git hooks to match what GDB did, and it's the Ada core Git hook backend that's fairly flexible for the hooks. Um, but I think we were, I think it's Python 2 based, so I think that's what we were talking about yesterday, and that's going to, I mean, we'll keep advancing it, but how complicated is your hooks integration right now with SVN? Not that complicated? I mean, Joseph might be able to talk about that. Is it more complicated than we have in glibc or less complicated? I don't think it's particularly more complicated. We will need to consider things like, do we want to, I guess we set it up like it is at present, say it would set up so that it sends out messages to GCC, CVS for all commits, but doesn't include the diffs in them. At least that's what it does at present. So that's a starting point. Also noting the persuasion, the go port is down to one test failure. So hopefully fairly soon, we'll have two different get conversions that we can compare. And I've been thinking about how we might check the CVS to SVN branch points, which I think are the main <coughs> point that's merely messing in the history at present. Okay. And I suspect either conversion would, could do with some work to correct some of the branch points that are way off where various branches are actually created. So Joseph, has anybody actually tried to use the ESR conversion with its one remaining bug in place, just to compare to see how big a difference there is between Maxim's conversion and and, and Eric's. I haven't tried using it with the bug still in place. I suspect, given how large and complicated the repository is, it's probably best to do things once that bug is fixed, which I'm guessing that Eric will get on to. I've looked at an old paper surgeon thing to look at some of the mess, look at some of the messy CVS to SVN branch points. And though it does have logic for fixing up some CVS to SVN artifacts, it certainly didn't seem to have fixed up all of them. Uh, so I'm suspecting that either conversion could probably do with some work for the branch points people have pointed out uh, in, are not in the right place. And that's probably some, basically some, heuris some heuristic thing. What commit on the branch it was based on is closest to the contents of the what it created as the first commit on the branch. If we're talking about Git hooks, one thing that I unfortunately have a claim to fame for is deleting trunk twice. It might be useful to put in hooks not to allow anybody to delete trunk or the main branches. Well, deletion, deletion is a bit, a bit different since deleting trunk in SVN is simply a commit. And in Git, I expect the hooks will say, you, or the repository configuration will say, you can't delete branches except maybe a user namespaces or whatever. So right. that some of the configuration will say, you can't delete master. 
Florian, do you remember if we set up glibc so we couldn't delete master? I think it was one of the configs in the, in the core hooks. Yeah. <laughs> the, I all, I've almost done it once, because you, an you, you just move an empty branch into the master and then it disappears. Yeah, the, GC, the GCC uh, git mirror is already set up, so you can only delete branches within your own uh, subdirectory. Okay. Uh, same with non-fast forward pushes. Yeah, we, we blocked it, I'm pretty sure, yeah. And we did the same thing. We have, we have user namespaces in glibc as well. Yeah, I, I, you're right. You get like there's ways around it. Like if you accidentally commit an empty tree, but then it's it's work. You, I don't think it's as accidental as as you're saying it is anymore. You literally would have to craft a really long Git push with the various URLs in an empty, I think an empty branch or something, and then push it in, and then great, you just pushed an empty branch. And <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, no, it's not easy is what, is what our point is. Like, you yeah, you couldn't. Like the work around to delete master is like you would have to try. It wouldn't be an accident. Yeah. So, so I think nobody has any other questions that we should just brainstorm how to damage the, the Git repo yeah. that we're <laughs> about no, to so, create. So we, like, Gary, I almost want to call you up because Pedro's not here, but like we have more representatives here than like the other projects. So we've got glibc, binutils, gcc, and like, if we had more chairs, I'd ask you to come up for GDB, but um, does anybody have any questions for the, for the projects as a whole? Everyone's happy. Everyone is spectacularly happy. Our job is complete. <laughs> it's a, well, yeah. Maybe uh, I'll mention that uh, as one of the authors of the Git hooks, you know, I'm quite happy to uh, talk about configuration and features that you might need. Uh, Python 2 obviously will, will take care of that. Um, but anything you need, if we don't have it, then we can always discuss how to improve them to give it to you. Sure. Please. Could, you, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Joel Brobecker. Uh, oh, I, we've only exchanged emails. We haven't, we haven't actually met in person. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, the project is on GitHub as well. So uh, you guys are free to open, uh, how is it called on GitHub, uh, you know, uh, problem reports or something like this, or suggestions, and then, uh, you know, always happy to help. We the did have this issue in glibc where hooks, where the hooks don't put mark the emails with a character set for some reason, so they don't come out properly when there are UTF-8 characters in them. I don't know, this seemed to have been something that for some reason we couldn't figure out how to fix. Uh, so the, the problem is that you get that incoming data and you have to scan the binary data and arbitrarily determine what character set it is because it's unidentified. So commit messages should be a UTF-8. Yeah, I think we just have to, this is, Joel, you and I have to have a discussion then and we'll clone the GitHub and we'll file a, uh, basically a bug report um, just to try to s detect the source file changes character set or just assume UTF-8 across the board. There's one point in the scripts where we convert and try to, we try, we basically try, I think, ISO 88591 and if that conversion fails in Python, we switch to UTF-8 and there's some kind of like logic that we need to clean up there, but that's it. So yeah, thumbs up, I agree. Yeah, we should be able to fix it. Microphone, is this the same? I, th I think a feature of UTF-8 is that if something decodes validly as UTF-8, then it is valid UTF-8, pretty much. Like, it's, it's quite hard to find a, a string of text that would decode as valid UTF-8 that is, is not. So um, glibc already uses Python for building GDB as well. We are using hooks for the uh, VCS, which are written in Python. So when do we allow Python uh, to be used in the GCC build? I'm asking because the outstanding, um, well, apparently outstanding uh, merge of GNU Modular 2 already uses Python for, for the build. So 
Would uh, that I, be a blocker for exception of Modular 2 in GCC? I, I, don't, I don't think it's a good idea to start using Python for the GCC builds yet. We, uh, we'll have to wait a few years because there's all this Python 2, Python 3 stuff, uh, and we actually built on a lot of uh, strange, stranger architectures, stranger distributions. So we have all the versions of those as well. So it's so too early be to switch, switch to using Python because Python is in a mess, right? So they're getting out of it now, but. Uh, well, I think that y the, the point is that GCC has a broad range of target operating systems right, that exactly. you have to get Python through. Yeah, so. you just use the Python on the host. Sure, but or on the build. You, you as a community need to do your own audit of this. And so the glibc community went through the same thing. We said, here's Python, here's everything we need to build on, here's the status of that on this. And then we went through and had to go check, 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 X, don't care, and go through that whole list. So as a community, if you guys want Python, my suggestion is that you, go, you have to go through that process because it, it is revealing what you want to build on and whether or not Python 3 will build on it or not. When GCC was written in C, it really was the case at one point b people built it on lots of weird Unices with lots of random proprietary compilers. Now it's written in C++. I suspect there are many fewer compilers that get used to build it. And I also suspect that these compilers are capable of building Python, but it is indeed something we need to investigate. Of course, there are also many fewer proprietary Unices out there now yeah. than there were at one point. I, I usually build on CentOS, and it does not come with Python 3 by default, and not a Python 3 you want anyway. Um, we can always consider just having some languages like Modular using Python for building. That's not a mm -hmm. blocker, because as long as we can build C and C++ without Python, then we can bootstrap ourselves. So that's. The modular part is not a blocker. Actually, we already used Python during the build, but we have the fallback to, to, to uh, shell and maybe. Uh, that doesn't make it a requirement, right? It's fine to have it optional. It's fine to start <laughs> using it. That's great. Then we know what works and what doesn't work. That's great. But making it a requirement yet is probably too early. That's all I'm saying. Well, some of us might like, say, to move the option handling stuff from Orc to Python, and that is required, given it's very target-specific and so on, so you can't just check in the generated files. So, thanks, David, for starting with um, a description of how vibrant the community is and how many commits we've had over the last year. It's good to hear someone stand up and talk about the momentum we have. My question for the steering committee is what's concerning you over the next uh, year of development in Guinea Toolchain? Well, 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 Jeff has a bath coming up later this afternoon, which I, uh, he, he is too humble to, to speak of himself. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say come to the bath. I, I will discuss things that concern me, uh, primarily around development and the policies, procedures, tools. I, I think there are things we can improve across the board. Um, one, of, one of them was Git, and I think we covered that already, but come to the buff. All right. How about anyone who's not running Jeff's buff later? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, we'll discuss this well. I think that the, the number of, of languages, I mean, we're going to discuss about how to make uh, I mean, both the advocacy session after this, which is more the GNU tools in general, and our, as I say, about marketing, which I invite all of you to, to stick around for, and, and Jeff's uh, boff coming up later this afternoon about processes, but to, to make this a smoother, uh, easier, um, and I think it's a fairly welcoming community, at least that's my experience. We can talk to some of the, the newly arrived uh, you know, companies and developers and see if they, they share that same experience, and maybe, maybe we should ask them. I mean, has there been any, with uh, some of the students, um, I mean, maybe that's a thing. If they have any feedback about the way that uh, uh, they've been able to interact with the uh, the community and the, in these communities, yes, Jeremy. If, uh... I, I was, I'd like to pick up on that. Just look, as someone who goes to both the LLVM and the GNU meetings, 
the average age in this room is a lot higher. When I go, I'm going to be at the LLVM Dev meeting in a month's time, it will be packed with PhD students. And as a recruiter, when people apply for jobs with me, they've always done LLVM. I actually do slightly more GNU work than LLVM work, and it's a real problem to get new people in. And I would highlight that, how do you bring the PhD students in? So when you're doing a PhD that needs compiler work, you don't automatically pick LLVM. Um, there's nothing against LLVM, mm -hmm. but if this project's going to thrive, we've got to have GCC people coming through as well. Right, and so I think that, you know, the, I think the challenges for us are, as, as Jeremy mentions, um, and, and again, this can go back to, to process, it's a matter of how to make GCC um, easier as, as a toolbox, more inviting as sort of a sandbox for people to play in. I mean, that's something that LLVM definitely excels at. Um, also, you know, there are a number of languages, I mean, not just Swift, which Apple committed, I mean, Rust, there are a number of languages and we're sort of discussing, or there's some proposals out there to now possibly have a, a Rust front end, which is the Linux kernel itself is sort of exploring, at least for some uh, extensions or modules. So, I mean, I think that's the concern is how to, to technically ensure that uh, GCC remains uh, a thriving you know, community that continues to innovate. I mean, again, unfortunately, uh, Richard Beener isn't here, but I mean, the incredible work of, of SUSE and Red Hat and everybody in this community, I mean, all the ARM stuff for, for glibc, I mean, it's an incredible amount of innovation. I mean, if you look at uh, some of the benchmarks, I mean, GCC continues to improve. I mean, it's a very mature, stable, excellent professional environment, professional compiler and assembler and linker and debugger and all the bin utils, all the pieces, and yet, you know, this incredible community here continues to find ways to, uh, to, you know, eke out more performance and eke out, you know, even better improvements and add, you know, the latest uh, compiler innovation technology, uh, and, you know, about optimization techniques into it. So I think that it's, uh, everybody should be very proud of that incredible accomplishment. Oh, so yeah, um, like definitely advocacy and then process stuff. I think we have two, two discussions on it today. Um, the one thing I wanted to highlight was that the question was, you know, what worries me? So what worries from, that I have that are kind of these deep-seated worries is like how do we incentivize reviewers? So how do we incentivize people in positions of leadership within the community to be able to look at the incoming work and both see like how does it fit structurally within the work to mentor people if they're submitting patches that that don't that aren't quite up to snuff and, and I don't have an answer for that right like if I if I had a lot of resources I'd almost want to make like a like a boot camp where if you say like hey you want to be a reviewer come to the boot camp and learn how to do review or learn how to learn how to mentor someone if they're they're bringing a patch in or a process in but incentivizing reviewers is one of the things that worries me because we we almost always have more work than we have people to review it, and it's a perennial problem that we, we don't often address. So I don't know how to review people, how to get people to be reviewers, so. I'd rather have more work than reviewers than have no work to what? review. I'd rather have not enough reviewers than no work to review. Yeah, but, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> but but it, is, yeah. it is a real issue. How, how do we as a project incentivize people to do reviews? It's far more interesting to write your own code than it is to look at somebody else's, at least for me. Um, and the irony is I do a lot of patch review. Um, I don't write a lot of code anymore. Um, how, how do we fix that? And, and that's part of the stuff I want to discuss this afternoon. So um, slightly different twist on the same kind of question. Uh, what do the different components see as technological gaps in our tool chain that need to be addressed over the next few years? Are you asking, like, within the compiler, what technologies within the compiler, or are you, are you asking a broader question? Uh, it's basically things like, do, do we have something missing? For example, in GCC, are there optimizations that we should be focused on that, we, that nobody has picked up on and wants to work on? Similar question for glibc and on down the line. Um, for GCC, I think it's less about optimization and more about analysis and diagnostics. And, um, you, you haven't been privy to the discussions that we have internally within Red Hat, but the, one of the things I've been trying to push our entire group towards is, is the diagnostic problem. Give good, actual diagnostics that allow the end users to be more efficient. Um, it, it helps us as well. Um, 
trying to get to that point where a, a mid-level developer can write code more efficiently helps everybody. And that's the, the one thing that's come from our customers through the years. They hire a lot of mid-range developers, make them more efficient. Make it so that they can't make terrible mistakes that, that cost them millions of dollars to fix. Um, so that, that's where I've, I've been trying to push a lot of our internal work is, is towards the diagnostic space. What I'd be interested in seeing is something wider than the technological challenges inside the compiler. I'd like to see uh, some of the optimizations like LTO as well as PGO being deployed in the wild and actually being used in the real world. Uh, that's one of the things that I'd like to see happen in the next three to five years. Well, and if you look at the, the SUSE guys, they've got, they've, got they've turned on LTO for their exactly. for the distro, and we're looking at that for Fedora 32 right now. So, but I, I think that is, you know, LTO, for example, should be pervasive. It should be, everybody uses it, and, and you don't really think about it. It's just always there. And once that happens, I think that means we can have more aggressive link time optimizations go in, things that we've historically uh, stayed away from, we can become more aggressive in those kinds of optimizations. Let me guess, structure reorganization. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and in, in today's world with, with, with the vector units, that's, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. It's a huge deal. deal. And, yeah. You know, we, we did the structure reorg pass 10, 15 years ago, however long ago, yeah. and it got ripped out because it wasn't really actually useful because you never had the scope you needed. In an LTO world, that scope is there. That scope is there. It unlocks a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, um, well, I was just thinking that the thing I'm going to have to look at, I think, over the next year is parallelizing the linker. Uh, linker performance is becoming an issue now. And uh, so I think that's going to, we're going to have to focus. That's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if anyone wants to volunteer to take that on, please let me know. Where is Ian when you need him? <laughs> um, I mean, I think also the, well, I hem and haw over this. Like, uh, there's been some discussions about dynamic loader performance, and Mentor posted some patches that we need to get around to reviewing. And I'm sorry, um, Quox here. I don't like the patches that got posted. Or actually, who posted? Chungling or Chungling? Yeah. So those patches look spectacular. And in fact, they actually have the like full K connected graph test that is like generate a whole like a million DSOs with like all their different things, and then make sure that they're all linkable. Uh, loader speed is an issue. Um, just trying to think of what else we would want. I mean, I think GDB and glibc face unique questions about usability across containers because um, you have customers now with like GPUs on their hardware and they want to run a container on the host, but then they need to punch the GPU drivers into the, into the container. So you need to break the isolation. And then there's all these questions of like, how does the loader handle that? How, like, is there a loader API? And so um, the people have been asking all these questions about, well, can DLM open solve that problem? Can it not? Can, uh, can we get a, a standardized loader API so that you could just talk, you could keep the loader consistent and then everything beyond the loader could get changed? Um, so there, there are questions about loader infrastructure and being able to alter the way the loader does things today that are things that I think we have a, we have a gap. But um, yeah, loader infrastructure. I don't know, tracing, visibility, right? Like you guys said, warning stuff for us, for me at least it's, um, you know, uh, SDT probes everywhere we can get them, SDT probes at um, syscall entry points and probes in places that are interesting for customers to be able to, in a production system, let's say, take any kind of tool that can use a uh, user space probe point and then stick a probe on it and then watch how many times that thing gets triggered or watch when those entry points happen. Um, I th we've had a lot of success with the, with the malloc tracer, tracing mallocs from customers and getting workloads, and we still use that a lot to change malloc implementation issues, so to determine if someone's use case is busted. So, and I want to work on that some more. So nobody's mentioned uh, GPUs, AI, and ML. But I mean, we, we don't have any, we have very little control. Like, when it comes to GPUs and AI and ML, we don't have control because the hardware vendors have very tightly controlled their ecosystems. And what we're kind of working with is like, the libraries are being punched into 
like you take a distro and then people will just drop in the libraries and the kernel drivers to interface with those systems and we just have to work with that. We can't even, like we don't have any conditions of changing those things but um, yeah, I mean from the compiler side I think you guys face more challenges of convincing the hardware vendors to use your particular technology because it's good or because you want to enable their use cases more broadly because if you use GCC to do all that stuff, then it becomes easier to integrate it with other objects that have been compiled with the same compiler, right? Like, same compiler tech across everywhere means if you use the same front end, then everything just works more smoothly. I just have to be able to load the object, so it's, it's much more <laughs> straightforward, but for us, it's an issue of, like, backwards compatibility, and even in some cases, customers asking us for forwards compatibility. Can you load things like that are kind of questionable in terms of of ABI, so. Yeah, the the the, the GPU space is is tough. Um, you know, those 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 of you who are poking in there, know it's not easy. And the compiler is just one piece of a huge ecosystem. Um, so we we can solve pieces of it, but I don't think we in this room have a complete solution, and uh, probably won't anytime soon. So. Um, so Mike, I have one comment on the uh, the GPU side. Um, AMD currently seems to have opened their their driver stack for most of the compiler developers. Um, last time I talked to them, most of their hardware is open for the newer versions. So we would just be really talking to them about what documentation and what they're looking at doing forward. I know they've done some stuff on the LVM side and they're looking at the GCC side as well for the backends. Um, so we'll just be talking to them and figuring out who to contact there about what hardware support you guys need. Absolutely. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. We're quite lucky in most of the GNU tools that security isn't a big issue. Um, most, Speak for yourself. <laughs> let, let me finish. Hold, hold, hold. Let me finish. Let me finish. Um, most of the tools are run standalone, but some of them aren't. Um, Glibc in particular is used by the entire community. Um, and even now, the compiler is growing things like compile server type things, and GDB is talking to debug servers or GDB remote. What can we as a community do to improve and make statements about the security of our code. Ouch. <laughs> um, the, the reality, and, and this is not true for GLibc, but if we look at GCC, for example, um, it's never been um, designed or thought of in those terms. That, that's going to require a complete change in how we think about uh, how we build a compiler and, and what are the implications of everything that we do. And, we as a community have not really thought about that problem. And it's, you're right, as you, as you move into a world of compile servers, for example, um, there's a huge set of problems there. And, and we've kind of put our head in the sand and kind of said, not a problem today. Um, will that change? Probably. Um, so I'm of the opinion that some of the, the Commercial interests, I think, can step in here and assist in doing some kind of auditing and review. So, for a lot, for several releases, we were doing actually covariety scans of GLibc's builds because, despite the fact that, like, you know, from a philosophical perspective, let's not let's not talk about the you know whether or not you like covariety or it's useful, but it continues to produce results where covariety finds defects that we as developers put into the sources, right? Static analysis is, is one thing where I think glibc could continue to do some static analysis every release. Uh, but what actually happened is that the free checker for Coverity for the open source communities fails with glibc currently because we have so many auto-generated templates in assembly that they dwarf the size of the measured C code so that the project says if you can't, they, they have this limit where it's like if you, ha, if you have scanned less percentage of your project than like 90%, they don't let you participate in the scan anymore because for some reason. I don't know why. It's just their policy. So because of our auto-generated templates, we are now, we were rejected from their 
ability to be scanned by their static scanner. But I would be happy to pick other static scanners that we can run as part of some kind of process to So to would that fix mean that. we would accept annotations into our source code that might help those scanners do a better job? My personal opinion is yes. I, like, I have a very pragmatic approach to getting quality out of the, the product, but that's not a thing I can answer by myself. That has to be a community decision. The community has to decide what tooling they want to use for the overall project. But I, as a release manager, was running Coverity, the open source Coverity scanner across the project, and it, it does catch defects. So, so out of curiosity, since we have a bunch of developers here, you know, who here would be opposed to adding annotations if we found that they were they'd be valuable for a static scanner that is potentially not open source? Yeah. Show of hands. Well, we need at least some because uh, otherwise, like, things like... Yeah, can, yeah can hold, wait for a mic so we can... Coverity has so many false positives on GCC because of the trailing arrays we use everywhere and in RTL, in Gimple, and so... So it I mean, it's so many uh, diagnostics that it's not useful to, to look through otherwise. And, and I'm thinking specifically of our trailing arrays on, on trees and RTL. You know, is, is there, would there be an objection to annotating those so that the static scanners know what those mean? Well, it of course, depends how the annotations look like, right? I mean, if you, if you, if you have to annotate every source line with two annotations, then no, that's not unacceptable if you put if we, on, if we can put them on the, if we can put them on the structure, then, then of course it's fine, right? I yeah. Mean. Uh, clearly, we can't put it at every site. That that would be impossible. Yeah. Um, but can we, if, if they can be attached to the structure for those particular cases, um, is, is that reasonable? Sure. <laughs> Microphones are hard when you're trying to have a discussion. <laughs> I mean, we essentially have those annotations because of the garbage collector. It needs the garbage collector needs to know how big these things are anyway. So the annotation is essentially there. It's not in a consumable form. You would almost, you could almost make a claim that they should use the same form. We should change ours to use the, you know, if it's Coverity as a scanner, then make our annotations for the garbage collector, use the Coverity form. Problem solved. All right, we can move on now. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's true. So we, we do face this problem of security. Like how do we show to a broader community of users that we are doing best practice to be as secure as we possibly can. And like, I assume that's your question, Richard, right? Like, what are we doing to show? So I think like static analysis is the biggest no-brainer that there is, that is we should be doing, I don't care what it is, we should just be doing some static analysis on either pre-commit, post-commit, or every release to determine from a baseline whether we've had regressions in the static analysis tooling. Um, once you get your baseline established, it's much easier to do it on a per commit basis after that to determine whether or not you've introduced defects. But we're finding real defects, so. And you'll see them because if you see me post create bugs for glibc and the bugzilla, you'll see when I go on a static analysis splits because I'll be posting two or three or four bugs simultaneously saying this is this and this is that and they'll be relatively, relative. some of them are benign, but still they're issues that need fixing. So a lot of the discussion of stack analysis tools has been about using other external stack analysis tools. Um, one thing I think I remember reading on the list was that David Malcolm was supposed to be doing um, some sort of creating some sort of new static analysis framework for GCC itself to become a stack analyzer or at least do more stack analysis type stuff. Um, if GCC eventually becomes good enough to do its own stack analysis, would we really need these external tools? Well, I think uh, different different projects implement uh, different different checks. Uh, certainly, David and and uh, Martin here have been adding uh, uh, various new new warnings to, to GCC to, to catch problematic uh, patterns. Um, other, other projects will have implemented different, different checks and it could be generally useful to, to compare. So um, I'm 100% in favor of the idea that we check 
what we do as best as possible. Um, not everybody who contributes to the project is an employee of a company that can afford to buy commercial tools. So uh, setting aside the philosophical reasons for using something open source to do it, there are practical reasons. I mean, you know, how many times have you seen on the list, well, you know what, I can't, I can't do spec 2006, I don't have it, right? So um, if there are adequate open source tools, they should be preferred. No, no objection to Coverity personally, but... Absolutely, um, and unfortunately, David had a family emergency and he's not here, so he won't be giving his static analysis talk, but that work is still ongoing. Just one more point on the static analysis. No two tools seem to agree on what sort of errors they find. So yep. the more the tools you have, the better it is. Yep, and if you look at best practices in Google, for example, they use both GCC and LLVM for all their builds to get diagnostics. They only choose one for the actual stuff they run, but in terms of their builds, they do both, and they look at the, the diagnostics admitted by both, and that should be standard practice for anybody building large software projects. I think from a, from a cost perspective, uh, you know, you can have pre-commit CI or tribots that watch mail comes in on the list, that mail goes into patchwork, that mail kicks off a pre-commit CI that runs, could run a, you know, commercially interested parties can have something that l plugs into that to run CobScan and give you the delta for the differential. And then this is one of the things that I've been talking to people about. How do you incentivize a reviewer to review? You make their job easier so that when they come to review, boom, they already have this list of like, what was the quality of this patch? Did it trigger new cop scan warnings? Did it trigger new, um, new build failures? Did, how, like, did we rebuild all 60 ABIs and find that one of them failed because of this patch, right? So whenever we can do that as a pre-checklist for reviewers, we make the reviewer's job easier, take away some of the drudgery, and then maybe more people are incentivized to review. Were you working on my slides when I was asleep? <laughs> Can I just ask the steering committee, there was the earlier question on technology where we asked about GPUs and ML. Can I just, we got skated over that quite quickly, I felt. Um, plenty of people here have heard me speak about the use of ML that we've done within the compiler for years. Can I ask the committee to look at where they see the technology going? Because I'm seeing emerging TPUs, IPUs, whatever you want to call them, the next generation of inference engines. And I'm seeing new open source compilers like NGraph emerging. I'm seeing LLVM doing its multi-level IR so they can support inference languages. And I don't see GCC ever in that discussion. So it's, there's two strands to this. Where, is GC, where do you see GCC heading in support of this new generation of processor type architectures? And secondly, where do you see that technology impacting within the compiler itself? Um, speaking for myself, um, right now we, we are totally missing that space. We're, we're not doing anything in there. Well, I, I probably shouldn't say it that emphatically. We are not um, as active as we need to be in, in dealing with the GPU space. We're just not. I don't have, I don't have the time. Um, and I would say that our team as a whole does not have the time. Uh, we are focused on other problems that uh, are just our priority right now. Well, I mean, th I think this is one of the questions for GCC GNU tools and this community in general is, I mean, to, with the limited resources, I mean, one is to obviously, you know, not just say that this is, you know, a, a, a pie and we're doing trade-offs, can we grow this community to address that, but also saying, is GCC's role to be the best at what it's doing? In other words, uh, I mean, somewhat of a niche. I mean, should it be this low-level C, C++, Fortran, this compiler, and be an Excel at that versus trying to be everything to everybody? I mean, it's, 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 I don't have an answer, but that's, you know, part of the, I mean, the question that this community should, you know, honestly address is, is our, you know, should we be, be chasing after every, new technology, new innovation, given the way that the GCC and, uh, both technologically is designed and the community functions? Or do we want to try to say, okay, we you know, have been the best as a, you know, a compiler C, C++ compiler for Linux, glibc, for these applications, and that we wish to continue to be 
uh, you know, the, the top solution in that space and how and to consciously devote our resources to ensure that we remain that as opposed to trying to spread it too thin? It's a legitimate question, David. Um, I think in the, the GPU space um, in particular, um, it's got legs. And, and I, I'm pretty conservative in that. I don't want to go chasing a lot of stuff. Um, and for resource issues, I, I did not prioritize GPUs from a Red Hat standpoint. Um, but if we, if we look at where we are and where I think we're going, GPUs is going to have legs. Um, I'm not saying we want to chase everything, but, but that one seems like it's a space that is uh, a big gap. Right, right, but I mean, but Jeremy's actually asking even the next step, sorry to interrupt, of the, the TPU, so these inference engines, which is even beyond that. And I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not following it. I mean, I, I, I look at it and say, I, we can't even, we're not even covering the GPU space right now. No, I but, understand. But, yeah. um, but I just want to say, I, it seems, I've always felt that the purpose of the GNU tool chain is enablement. We want to enable users to do development without having to use proprietary software. We don't necessarily have to be the best. It's nice if we can. But we want to enable the users, and that should be the priority. If, if, so if, if we want to enable users to experiment with GPUs and develop things, even if we're not the world's best GPU compiler. But we've got to be good enough to matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the problem, if we, if we go back a few years uh, before Mentor really started working in this space, um, we had nothing. And then we had something that, that couldn't perform well enough to actually matter. Now we, you know, because of the, the work that MentorGraphs has done, we're, we're getting close to having something that, that is really usable. Um, but we're, you know, probably you know, eight years behind the game. And there's a whole ecosystem beyond just what you have to build in the compiler to actually do something with. And the, um, well, let's see, I'll be very careful how I choose my words here. Um, certain vendors can be disincentivized from uh, helping us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm but, it, but again, getting back to the, the TPU space, I mean, this is um, you know, one of the fundamental you know, features of LLVM, LLVM is the LLVM IR, which is a very extensible IR and, is, and you know, is designed, I mean, it has its advantages and its disadvantages for all of the different purposes to which it's been applied, but the ability to then work up this stack with a generalized uh, types of objects and doing generalized operations and generalized objects in this general in that that framework. I use general way too many times there, but you know. And currently, Gimple, I mean, doesn't have that. It, it can't easily be adapted to that type of uh, repurposed for that. Yep. And and you might ask if Gimple is even the right mm -hmm. level. You know, is it is it LTL or is it something more closer to, to what LLVM is doing as an IR? I, I don't know. It's also the question of providing the interfaces and guaranteeing some stability in the IR. LLVM that, doesn't do that yet either. Well, they, they, <laughs> they're they, closer. They're closer. They're much closer than we are. Yeah, uh, but, and, but, but again, and the, the ability of LLVM, I mean, at least this, this sort of the basic infrastructure to be able to just add on exactly. these operations where, I mean, yes, we could add on, you know, build up Gimple, but Gimple really wasn't designed for that. I'm not sure that how much LLVM sort of lucked into this versus was de, you know, truly designed for. I mean, it's definitely designed as a flexible environment. The fact that it's able to, to build up into this, I don't know whether that was Chris's foresight or not, but it, it is able to more easily capture that and again leverage the ex not just the infrastructure, but the, the experience and knowledge of that developer community to more rapidly um, utilize that same infrastructure to then apply to these TPUs. So yes, we could change the LTO, we could change Gimple, whatever, but it's, uh, you know, it, it would be a more radical transformation and therefore a, a steeper learning curve for anybody who wanted, even if we provided that infrastructure, to then utilize this different one. People can reuse, developers in this TPU's MLI space can reuse their general experience and, in, and, and, and um, their, their instincts about how LLVM works to apply it to MLIR. Could, could I add that LLVM, of course, has had to move the IR on, which is why you've got the new multi-level IR, yeah. because IR itself, even with all its general, it wasn't good enough for the job. But that's okay. It's ex that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but... Hello. 
So what other open source communities do you think we, we should be reaching out to and uh, collaborating better? I know OVM is the obvious answer, but there, is there anything else? Um, well, since we're talking about G, GPUs, uh, Python. That is the biggest space when I, when I look at, at what's going on in the GPU space. We don't have enough interaction with the Python community to build um, systems that people can rely on in terms of, of ABI, API, and stability. And Ramana can probably talk more about that. Right. <laughs> I'd say that's true even of the AI ML space. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are building a lot of their um, logic using Python APIs that some of these frameworks provide. And that's, where, that's the level at which a lot of ML developers are actually operating. So Python would be a good bet. Uh, the other side of the Python story is figuring out how do you distribute Python binaries or py, uh, Python modules, whatever they call them. Um, and that's an interesting problem as well. Well, I think another area is not necessarily, well, I mean, there, there's two facets to this. I mean, one is talking about language. I mean, talking about the Python software foundation, Python's language, and, and other languages that um, these other communities. Uh, the other is in the, the free, libre, and open source software space, which we can talk about more in the, the advocacy boff coming up next, but the Linux Foundation, which has been reaching out to us and seems to be willing to to collaborate. I mean, so that's another area to try to leverage their infrastructure, their administration, their advocacy. Um, I mean, and, and there are, as, as you know, many of us discuss privately, there, there are uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages to that as well. I mean, given the, but, but the Linux Foundation seems to be as, um, you know, many, I mean, I, know, I think RISC-5, did they join? That now? I mean, at least Open Power has joined. I mean, there's a lot of them that sort of trying to come under that umbrella. Uh, and um, the Linux Foundation seems to be trying to uh, uh, to create a broader uh, broader tent, broader umbrella for this this general space. So, the Linux kernel would be another project that we could reach out to. I'm sure they've got requirements from the compiler. Any time I chat with kernel developers in ARM, they keep asking me, "Can the compiler do this? Can the compiler do that?" We are trying. To yeah, I, I would say that the. The interest afoot has started several years ago with many of us, and I know who are here, going to LPC to reach out. I think that that is a well early identified need where we had a tools microconf at um, LPC, and we continue to have it because, like, the first time I went to LPC in um, in New Mexico and I gave a talk, it was like every talk I walked to, people were like, "Well, I wonder if we could get a compiler that could do this," and I'm like, "No, that's an intractable problem. It's MP. You won't be able to solve it." And they're like, "Oh, well, who are you? Oh, you know about tools." Excellent, like we have 50 other questions for you. And there was no tools microconf at that point. But I, it's absolutely required to level set people's expectations about the tool chain to have us go to LPC. We should identify the equivalent, like what's the Python? PyCon. What, PyCon, yeah. yeah. We should identify PyCon and send people to PyCon and fund that or support it or in some way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's many ways in which we can support that kind of uh, advocacy and yeah. outreach, but this is going to just overlap into your talk about well, advocacy, uh, right? Well, so, I mean, I, I don't yeah. specifically have a talk, but I mean, again, the relationship, I mean, we, we now, you know, did, I mean, I guess I, I, I don't know if it was last year, I mean, we did receive a rather large donation to the GNU Toolchain Fund, and part of it is, you know, how do we want to spend that money? Uh, because in general, with, with fundraising, uh, I mean, there are other donors out there, we can probably get more money, but donors generally don't want to write a, a, a a, a general check. I mean, they don't want to say, okay, just for the, the goodness of GNU tools. They want to say, we're giving money for this. We're giving money for that. We're giving money to, for this Git conversion. We're giving money for, uh, to you know, improve you know, the Bugzilla. We're giving money for this. We're giving money for, for students because it's not an infinite pool of money. So yes, I mean, we were discussing about uh, the, 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 uh, the audience, the people who come to, let's say, the, the Cauldron versus come to the LVM Del Developers Conference. And yes, there are many uh, PhDs there, but also the corporations that are involved with LLVM are putting a lot of money into uh, sponsoring students. It's not just a matter of, okay, we want some piece of work done this way, but sponsoring professors, sponsoring students, and PhD students, postdocs, and 
you know, uh, the GNU toolchain fund doesn't have an infinite amount of money. I mean, even probably to pay for one, you know, graduate student for one year. I mean, so it's a matter of how to um, both grow in this space, but also how to uh, to find the right way to utilize the funds that we have to to uh, improve our our positioning in this space. To go to um, you know to PyCon, to go to you know LPC, to go to I mean, there there are only yeah. there there are, there are lots of ideas. I mean, and, and yes, we can talk about this in the advocacy, but I'll also, you know, just state up front here, the advocacy is not for people to say, oh, you, David, should work on this as well, or you, Carlos, should work on this. We all have ideas. You know, it's a matter of how do we as a community work to address this and to make this a more vibrant and you know, community that, that really is attracting new developers and, uh, you know, working with our companies to sponsor somebody to go to PyCon to sponsor people, the LVM, you know, Developer Summit, to sponsor it to the LPC. It's not a matter of, oh, yeah, you, you, know, you should do that. You know, there, there, Wait, everybody... Is, isn't it actually a matter of that? Shouldn't, like, isn't, isn't that what we actually need to do, though? We need to, like, and you say, I'm going to do X? Yes, but, okay. but it's, it's individually we need, not, not a matter of having 140 people saying, here's my list of things that, you know, the steering committee should do for me. Oh, no, yeah, you guys need to do it for sure. I'm doing stuff too, but you you need to go do this. So, um, I mean, like right off the bat, the Python. I mean, the GNU toolchain is uniquely poised for Python because the Python wheel ABI is effectively based on the GNU ABI. The baseline ABI for Python wheels is the GNU ABI. It's like GCC plus glibc plus a bunch of other libraries is their base ABI. Um, and I've been working with uh, Subin Modil, who's in the Python community, to write a write some, like, like guide the community on how to keep that ABI stable, how to move forward to matching ABIs and all that stuff. And we as a community for a compiler and library and tool authors need to help that Python community understand what those, what that ABI means and how to move forward and how to keep them in lockstep moving. So I think that's, that's probably a gap for AIML, Python, and us helping them. So PyCon probably is a, is a good outreach for us. Uh, may I ask a question about uh, compiler performance? Uh, Nick uh, said already that uh, parallelizing of linker is a task, but uh, especially for modern C++, compilation time is uh, not very good now in GCC, and when you're building lots of code, like the whole firmware or whole operating system, that becomes a problem. Is this a priority task, or do you consider it a fixed well, I mean, uh, perform, uh, compiler, compile time performance is, is always interesting and periodically uh, go through and, and find uh, hotspots that are slowing things down. Uh, Nathan has been working on the C20 uh, modules feature that ought to help a lot uh, with, uh, with C++ uh, compilation time. Uh, Yes, we've, we've can, can I just raise an issue? Go fast. Sorry, an, an, an issue, Pamela. Um, I'm getting complaints from users saying that they can't build Firefox on 32-bit systems, 32-bit arms. It's just too big. I mean, it, it takes a long time to link, but they just can't link it. It's too big. And my question for, for people here is: Is it worth trying to fix that, or are we now all moving to 64-bit systems, and we're going to say 32-bit is dying out? Yes, split, split off would help a lot, but I'm, I'm looking towards the future. Is everything moving to 64-bit? I wish everything was moving 64-bit. <laughs> I, I wish everything was moving 64-bit, but um, from what I see, and then I'll put, you know, I'll have a red hat on, but from what I see just from a, a red hat standpoint, we can't. We are still being pushed to do 32-bit stuff. We, we, it, it just won't die as much as we well, maybe try to kill it. I don't think Firefox is that unique. I think that there are multiple projects that are getting really close to bumping I mean, up against Node that. Node.js is also really getting pushing it. But, uh, but there's the IoT space, the embedded space, I mean, for which you know, GNU Tools still functions very well, very importantly, which is the entire other side of the, you know, the perspective. Yep. I, as much as I would like 32-bit to die, it, it just isn't. I think or, it's uh, important to differentiate between the target and the host. 
And uh, I mean, it, it's uh, it's. I mean, it, we 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 as distributions like Debian, Fedora, and, and we tend to build natively. And you can't build IoT stuff on the IoT device itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and I think that the, the, the picture is changing to a 32-bit as well, so that you just have to cross-compile on 64-bit hosts. And that will help to keep the architectures alive longer, even if the tool chain itself can't do external sorting algorithms in the linker or something like that. Cross-compilation is an option, but it's pretty hard to get a distro up and running entirely on cross-compilation. Yeah, uh, but... And then they end up being second-class citizens in the build systems of the packages as yeah, well. Yeah, I think that the Debian approach is pretty interesting because they... Yeah. That uh, you can uh, cross-install packages there, so... It, it might be something that, that could see why they use and help with that. So, just as... Sorry. So we we can continue on with this for a little bit. I said we already crossed over a little bit into advocacy. I don't know if we maybe try to finish these two questions and then to give people a chance. And so so. So, Uli. so I just have a very quick additional comment to the question of linker memory consumption. And I, I believe it is an issue even on a 64-bit system. Like, just one example, I regularly build LLVM, and if you, if you have a large C++ application with debug information, and it's not just one executable, it builds a dozen executables, and they all run to the link stuff in parallel. If you run a make-j, <coughs> then you, even in a 64-bit system, you run into the out-of-memory killer. Yeah, that's, that's so a bug is, with their make files. Yeah, uh, and it's... A, <coughs> and it's... I, I mean, and to be fair, there is a switch to switch it off, but okay. 32-bit, um, very quickly on the 32-bit, yes, with debug, Clang does fail on the 32-bit system as well. Um, actually, this whole thing brings to mind one of the first questions, which is, there's some piece of technology that we're missing. And it seems that from the discussions on modules and from the discussions on the uh, G GSOC parallelization of the middle end of the compiler. One real problem we have is that we have this thing called make, which understands it can do parallel jobs. And then we have things inside the compiler that want to do parallel jobs. Uh, and it kind of looks like we could do with inventing a new tool that actually understands the fact that it, it has to have different levels of granularity of parallel action. Composability of build systems. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, but this is even a little bit more specific because we're just talking about the compiler part of it. And uh, Nathan was talking about uh, in the in the modules tooling buff yesterday, talking about integrating uh, make with the uh, the modules uh, server, and uh, suggesting that, that that kind of thing could be more broadly applicable. Yes, because after all, say the make job server protocol is something reasonably simple for other things parallelizing stuff to do. So the thing I was wondering in the modules buff is if the, then this more general protocol for the compiler saying it needs a, to find a particular module could also be something suitably generalized for different tools to implement and use. So at the uh, beginning of this year in January or February, Ubuntu asked um, the community how it would be to drop the i386 port. So we are not uh, building uh, images anymore for i386, but we are providing binaries. And when we finally announced to drop that in July or August, um, there was a big uproar that, uh, well, some community projects and Steam, uh, well, said, well, we don't support Ubuntu anymore, so apparently we have to support them. I'm not saying that um, we need big applications on on these platforms anymore. And um, even then, if we would need them, uh, we should be able to, to build them with 64-bit uh, tools. Because I think no distro runs 32-bit kernels anymore. Everything is built and run on 64-bit kernels. So you should be able to use 
a 64-bit compiler targeting i386 to do that. Um, that, from my point of view, would resolve most of the problems. And yeah, for, On the other thing, I think it's still too early to drop uh, things like ARM HF, the so 32-bit ARM. There's too much usage compared to i386. Okay, so th thanks very much. Any final uh, any response to that uh, from the steering committee or, or comments? I mean, I think we should. First of all, I mean, thank everybody from the steering committee. Thanks for everybody here. Is participation and, and being a member of the, I mean, th thank you the, the people here who are volunteering to, to help with this community. And thank, thank yourselves and again, uh, thank to, to Jeremy and Simon for, for hosting the, uh, you know, GNU Cauldron this year. And uh, so, uh, and just wanted to point out, talking about memory, that, that the new Z15 systems from IBM have 14 terabytes of memory to be able to host it. So, you know, there, 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 there are certain systems out there who can address this. You know, uh, we, we, we ask any of the IBMers here and we can help you get in contact with a salesperson. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my shipping address in a couple of moments. <laughs> exactly. Well, you already have a couple of those systems. <laughs> Not in my house. <laughs> oh, well, you didn't ask. <laughs>